Excellent. I, I know you. I know you wish you were here. Yeah, oh, definitely. <laughs> well, you Everyone. know, this is your, this is your, this is one of your ancestral homes because this is where you started. <laughs> exactly. In fact, that's my ancestral home intellectually. It's there you go. Because honor. <laughs> how long yeah, ago was it? Um, I oh, think we. Was, we are oh. live, uh, we are to start. And uh, so um, my name is Ruthie Rono um, from USIU. I'm a faculty member and a professor of psychology. And I'm the moderator uh, for this afternoon's uh, launch. So good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good night to everyone to all the participants who are here today, uh, who come from all, almost all the continents around the world, from different countries. And it is really an honor for me uh, to be your moderator this afternoon here in Nairobi on the occasion of the Codestria and USIU Africa uh, book launch, uh, uh, book by Professor Paul Tiambe Zeleza. Uh, titled Africa and the Disruptions of the 21st uh, Century. It's an honor for us at USIU uh, to be part of this great uh, book launch and having our own vice chancellor uh, being the author uh, of this book. You are glad to know, or you would like to know that uh, the number of people, uh, participants who are registered here today for this uh, book launch are distinguished scholars academicians, uh, higher education administrators, writers, and government uh, officials interested in higher education who have taken time to participate in this book launch. As to, uh, by the time we are starting, we had over 382 participants registered and continuing to join. And they are from 55 different countries from the Americas from Europe, from Asia, from South America. And we are glad that you are here with us this afternoon. We will have uh, presentations, uh, opening remarks as uh, the program that has been um, shown um, on the platform. Uh, we'll have the opening remarks and then we'll have Professor Paul Tiambe Zeleza uh, give us um, a brief of his book. And then we'll have interventions uh, by a number of distinguished scholars and vice chancellors and writers from across the globe. Um, interventions regarding the book and they'll be quite very brief. And then followed by that, we'll have response to the interventions and questions. And I would like <coughs> to request uh, all participants who may have questions that they would like to pose to a specific speaker or to Professor uh, uh, Tiambe Zelesa specifically. When you post your question on Q&A, it would help us to know whom you are directing the question to. Uh, so we are, you are actually encouraged as the presentations go on, you are encouraged to post any questions you may have and indicate whom you like to um, you know, to uh, answer the questions. And I, I would uh, suspect most of the questions will go to you, Professor Zeleza. Um, would also appreciate if you can register with us so that we know who is here, although we, we can still play the, the video, but it would be nice for the rest of the participants to know who is uh, here by registering uh, on the chat and uh, making comments and or uh, observations uh, on the chat. We have, uh, like I said, uh, very distinguished scholars everywhere uh, from across the globe. And we want to acknowledge you. Uh, I know that we may not be able to give each one of us an opportunity to say something. Uh, most of us will be listening and um, taking note and asking questions. And therefore, um, it would be good for us to know who you are as you post your name and your you know, institution where you come from uh, on the chat and also post your questions that we'll address at the end. Um, the last um, observation that will be made, the vote of thanks will be done uh, by Dr. David Desai, who is the chair of our board of trustees and the principal secretary for the Kenyan Ministry of East African uh, Community and eventually uh, the closing remarks will be made uh, by the Codestria Executive Secretary, Dr. Godwin Murunga. 
So with those very few introductory and welcome remarks, uh, it's now my pleasure to invite Dr. Godwin Murunga to make his remarks. Welcome, Dr. Murunga. Well, thank, th thank you very much, uh, Professor Rono, for the opening remarks. And thank you very much, all the colleagues joining us, uh, those who we can see uh, on our screens and many, many others, roughly uh, 130 signed on at the moment from different uh, countries for taking time out of what I am sure is a busy demanding schedule uh, to join us for this occasion of the launch of uh, Professor Paul T. Ambezadeza's book, Africa and the Disruptions of the 20th Century. Uh, on behalf of Codestria, the executive committee and its broader membership, uh, it is indeed an honor and a privilege uh, to have this kind of audience signing in to listen to engage in an event uh, that has been collaboratively organized between uh, Codestria and the United States International University, uh, Nairobi. Uh, of course, uh, it is indeed also uh, only fair that uh, it is Professor uh, Paul Tiambezeleza, uh, who is the focal point here, uh, given that uh, in many, many ways, and uh, I do this with all uh, respect for the United States International University, uh, Professor uh, Paul Zeleza is in every sense of the word, a child of pedestrian. And uh, if you can see me on the screen, I am not even blinking about that. Uh, it is uh, uh, this morning, uh, yesterday I was having a conversation with Professor Ibo Mandaza uh, from Zimbabwe, and uh, we've been looking for a particular uh, article that was written by the late uh, Professor Tandika Mkandawi, the Kodestria Stad uh, Executive Secretary. And for a year, we had not uh, found this article until yesterday when he sent me uh, this article titled A Kind of Homecoming, uh, which was published in 1994, uh, uh, when he actually returned to Malawi. Uh, after spending over 30 years in exile. And uh, the first thing, of course, I did was to skim through. And on the second page of that article, uh, he's writing about when he got back to Malawi and uh, he was uh, just settling in and, uh, quote, unquote, I met uh, Tiambe Zeleza, the Malawian historian writer, younger brother, and had an interesting discussion with him and his colleagues. Uh, that's perhaps where the journey uh, <laughs> begins. And uh, so in a sense, also, it's a celebration of our departed uh, colleague, Professor Tandika Mkanda Wire, whose uh, anniversary of his death uh, is coming up on, on, on Saturday. Uh, I am using those remarks to make, really to make two points in this introductory uh, session. The first point is um, that Codestria has been around for roughly 45 years. And we've been publishing books for a very long time, actually. Uh, perhaps running the, the one social science journal that has had an interrupted uh, series of publications since the 1970s. Among the books we have published uh, are two key books written by Professor Zeleza, single authored books, A Modern Economic History of Africa, and Manufacturing African Studies and Crisis. There are others that Professor Zeleza has edited. I can think off the top of my head uh, at least two or four others that he has edited. But these two are special, partly because the journey for a modern economic history of Africa begins at Kenyatta University, where Zeleza was uh, um, teaching at the time and was asked to teach a course on a modern economic history of Africa and at the end of the day was able to apply to Codestria uh, for, uh, for funding and ended up writing the book, A Modern Economic History of Africa. It's one of the books that has, uh, list, is listed among Codestria's award-winning books. Uh, it won the Noma Award for publishing. And uh, soon after, the Zeleza put together the essays that uh, constitute manufacturing African studies and crisis. And again, that particular publication did um, uh, win the special commendation from the Noma Award for publishing uh, in Africa. Uh, Prof will not deny the fact that uh, it is after that 
that things started happening pretty quickly for him, uh, leading to his departure from Kenyatta University, his sojourn in the US, in Canada, uh, Jamaica also, um, and ended up eventually back in Nairobi, in a sense, a homecoming. But I'm happy today that he's ended up back in Kodesu. And that we are holding this event now is important to me and important to the council, partly because for me, it represents a revitalization and indeed an announcement of our reemergence stronger uh, in relation to our publishing uh, work. Uh, when Professor Zeleza got in touch to share this, uh, the essays that make up this book, uh, we were very excited about the opportunity of having to demonstrate again that we were a publisher of not, and it took us roughly six months to turn this manuscript into what uh, we have here. Uh, doing it exclusively from Dhaka and being able to produce this publication has indeed been a journey that has, in a sense, made me very happy. And I want to make a special mention as I conclude of one of our colleagues whom I'm hoping she's online, uh, Sandy Shepherd. Um, when Professor Zeleza sent us this manuscript, he made the subtle argument that the manuscript was sufficiently, I can see Sandy is online, the manuscript he argued was sufficiently copy edited. And then we say, let's just try it with one of our copy editors and see how it's going to work. And at the end of the day, you would enjoy the conversation that took place between Sandy on one hand and Professor Zeleza on the other hand. And I'm really happy that the book is out, but I'm even happier that Sandy is online with us because the work she does for the council in terms of turning manuscripts into what we eventually read uh, is something worth celebrating. I want to make a final apology uh, to colleagues who speak French. Uh, we are unable to have this uh, discussion in French and it's an apology I want to extend because our desire uh, to be Pan-African in your orientation is something that we don't shy away from. Uh, we'll be doing more uh, of our webinars in uh, English and French and I hope that uh, we'll have an opportunity to also to discuss Professor Deza's book in other languages, uh, in French, in Portuguese, in Swahili, if uh, our colleagues in East Africa can facilitate this. So again, thank you very much colleagues for agreeing to join us for this event. On behalf of the council, we do appreciate very much and I'm looking forward to an excellent discussion this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Murunga, uh, for that uh, very uh, brief highlight of Professor Zeleza's academic journey. Uh, and it's really a, a great pleasure to host him uh, in this uh, book launch. Uh, actually, when Professor Zeleza came to USIU in 2016, it was like uh, meeting an old friend, uh, having had uh, uh, you know, an experience or have met him in Kenyatta University when we were both faculty members in the early 80s. So it was good to see him come back home and um, having been in a position to always uh, work with him, introduce him, I've always um, you know, admired his scholarship, which actually has spanned all his academic life. And he has been quite a great role model uh, for many uh, academics who are actually upcoming to see the kind of work that he has, come, you know, he has done over the years. And so what you have highlighted is really very commendable. And therefore, Professor Celesa, congratulations uh, for your achievements before, but even more importantly for to, what, we are launching, uh, uh, what we are launching today uh, in this book launch. Before I ask you to um, uh, give your presentation, I'd like to introduce you, uh, you know, in a, again, in a, a very, very brief way uh, for many of our participants who may not um, have met you before. So uh, Professor Zeleza has been at dozen universities in six countries on three continents and the Caribbean region. He has held distinguished academic and senior administrative positions in Canada and the United States for 25 years before taking the position as vice chancellor, which is equivalent to president, and then professor of the humanities and social sciences at United States International University, Africa, in January 2016. He has published more than 300 journal articles, book chapters, reviews, short stories, and online essays and authored or edited 28 books, several of which have won international awards. He has presented about 250 keynote addresses, papers, public lectures at leading universities and international conferences in 32 countries, 
and served on the editorial boards of more than 2,000 journals and book series. He presently serves as editor-in-chief of the Oxford Bio Bibliographies Online in African Studies and is currently a member of the administrative board of the International Association of Universities, the advisory board of the Alliance for African Partnerships, as well as chair of the advisory council of the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program that he helped establish. He is also the chair of the board of trustees of the Kenya Education Network and is a member of the University Council of Ghana. Welcome, Professor Seleza, to present your book. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Godwin, uh, for those uh, wonderful introductory remarks, and uh, Ruthie, Professor Rono, uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, I would like to begin by welcoming uh, all the participants to this book launch. I truly appreciate uh, your presence uh, wherever you are. I'm, I'm uh, delighted that the participants come from uh, dozens of countries. Please allow me to begin my brief remarks by expressing my deepest gratitude to the following organizations and people. My publisher, Codestria, uh, for the opportunity to publish this book with them. Codestria is the most important social science network in Africa and one of the leading social science networks in the world. Since its establishment in 1973, and especially in the 1980s and 1990s, when African universities and intellectual communities were under the assault of structural adjustment programs imposed by the international financial institutions and authoritarian post-colonial states, Codestria for my generation became an invaluable space of unfettered, robust African knowledge production. And I see a lot of my colleagues uh, from those days. I last published with Codestria in 2008 uh, with a two volume book, The Study of Africa. And I'm really delighted uh, to publish with Codestria again. Secondly, I want to thank my institution, USIU Africa, and all my colleagues, including Professor Ruthie Rono, who until two months ago was our uh, DVC for Academic and Student Affairs. And she and I worked very, very closely as uh, administrators at this wonderful university. I also wish to thank Dr. Kevin Desai, the chair of our board of trustees, uh, who is the permanent secretary in the Ministry for East African Community, Government of Kenya, and he'll be giving the closing remarks. And uh, also at USIU, I'm grateful uh, for our marketing and communications team, led by Ms. Irene Onacha, that worked seamlessly with colleagues at Codesria to put the launch together. And then thirdly, I, I wish to thank the four friends who wrote endorsements for the book. Two of them are with us this afternoon. Uh, one of the authors of the endorsement was Professor Henry Lewis Gates, the Afonso Fletcher University Professor at Harvard University. The other uh, is Professor Alondra Nelson, the Harold F. Linda Professor at the Institute for Advanced Study and President of the Social Science Research Council, who currently serves as Deputy Director for Science and Society for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. She was appointed by the Biden administration a couple of months, uh, a few weeks ago. And then we have uh, Professor Fumi Olanisekan, uh, Vice President and Vice Pr uh, Principal International, Professor of Security, Leadership and Development, King's College, London. And you'll be able to hear from her. And Professor Tawana Kupe, Principal and Vice Chancellor, University of Pretoria, who also you'll be hearing from. Fourthly, I want to give special thanks to my friends who kindly agreed to join the launch and make comments. All of them are very dear to me, and I'm a great admirer of their academic work, their role as public intellectuals and scholar activists. They will all be introduced shortly by the moderator. With some of them, like Sir Hilary Bacos, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, we go back four decades. He and I joined the history department at uh, uh, the University of the West Indies as young lecturers in our mid-20s in 1982. 
So it's about 40 years ago. I feel deeply indebted, fifthly, to the various outlets where some of the essays were first presented and posted. And my network of friends and intellectual collaborators who read and commented on the essays in their draft form. Please allow me to single out my life partner, Cassandra Rachel Vini. She is to quote Tony Morrison, a friend of my mind, as I am a friend of her mind. She's always the first person to read anything I write before it leaves our intimate and exclusive conversations and enters the public realm. Six, I want to uh, appreciate all the participants, including numerous friends and colleagues in various institutions and networks that I've been associated with since the 1970s. Among them is Professor Toin Falola, the illustrious and prodigious scholar based at the University of Texas, Austin, with who I recently conducted a 25,000 word interview of my personal and professional journey. Another is Chukos, Chukosa Silungwe, the Attorney General of the new government in Malawi, installed after mass struggles by Malawians against the rigged elections of May 2019. Malawi became the second country after Kenya where the presidential election was annulled by the Supreme Court, and the first where the opposition proceeded to win the re election. A special shout to members of my family, including my lovely daughter, Natasha Tandile. In the remaining uh, minutes, let me say a few words about the book by reading a few paragraphs from the preface and summarizing the five sections uh, of the book. I write this preface in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and lockdowns in many countries around the world, including Kenya, where I currently live. A major crisis, not only hugely disruptive, it always holds a giant mirror to society, and this, in this case, to the world at large, exposing its underlying structural deformities and dysfunctions. The coronavirus pandemic offers a stark reflection of national and global political economies in disarray and the colossal underinvestments in the economic and social well being of the masses of working people. Engendering the multiple crises brutally pried open by the pandemic, where the austerities, inequalities, and ideological inanities of neoliberal globalization, retrogressive populisms, and wanton assaults on nature and the environment. The essays in this volume seek to make sense of the various disruptions and dysfunctions of the early 21st century for Africa, of which the coronavirus pandemic is sadly symptomatic. They were written from two locations, namely the United States, where I lived for more than two decades, and Kenya, where I moved to take up a new position in January 2016. Thus, they reflect discourses from mutually reinforcing special temporal positions in North America and Africa, the global North and the global South, the African continent and the diaspora. As such, the essays combine observations and analysis of developments in these spaces that particularly intrigued me or struck, uh, struck me as significant. In short, they represent my personal meditations as an engaged Pan-African scholar and global citizen on key developments during the second decade and beginning of the third decade of the 21st century. The book is divided into five parts. And of course, our commentators uh, will have a chance to elaborate on some of them. The first part deals with what I call America's racial dysfunctions. So it uh, talks about uh, you know, different aspects of the United States, including the uh, you know, police, uh, police brutality, uh, you know, the uh, uh, attacks on Obama, the tragedy and farce that is Trump's America, and then uh, reckoning with 400 years, the commemoration of the arrival of the first enslaved Africans uh, in uh, Virginia, uh, an event that my wife and I uh, attended. And then it ends with the uh, American uprising of 2020, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Secondly, it looks at global turbulence from Brexit, the Western Alliance in disarray, the turbulent 2010s, 
the coronavirus itself, uh, the, uh, what I call the, in, in the essay, uh, that deals with that, the political economy of a pathogen. And then the whole issue of how we can mobilize the diaspora for African development. The third uh, uh, section deals with what I call Africa's political dramas, beginning with a long um, assessment of President Mandela as an activist, as a politician, as a leader, as a Pan-Africanist. Then the Zuma saga and the post-colonial reckoning of South Africa, Zimbabwe's political crisis, a tale of failed transitions, Kenya's election watershed, and the promise, uh, the promise of African democracy. And that section ends with Malawi's political earthquake. The fourth part deals with a perennial concern of mine, namely how Africa is constructed, how Africa is imagined, how Africa is represented. Uh, and, and in this section, uh, it's entitled Africa's Persistent Mythologization. Uh, and it looks at how um, you know, Africa was perceived during the you know, Ebola crisis several years ago. And it, then it moves to how you know, Trump uh, tried to homogenize and dehumanize the continent with his famous statement. And it looks at Black Panther, the movie. Uh, uh, well, you know, of course it was very popular. I think uh, it, it's kind of reprises uh, a colonial gaze of some type. And then it looks at the very important question, how do we decolonize African knowledges? And then finally in that section, reckoning with the past and reimagining the futures of African studies for the 21st century. The final section looks at higher education, which is of course something that uh, you know, I've been very interested in as a practitioner, but also as a scholar. Uh, I talk about the six capacity challenges of African universities, rethinking the value proposition of university education, the challenge of employability for our graduates, Africa internationalization and the global context, the challenges and opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution for African universities, and the financial crisis facing universities from the United States to Kenya and elsewhere. I end the book with, uh, um, in memory of two towering African intellectuals, Ali Mazrui and Tandika Nkandawiri, both of whom I had the privilege of knowing. Thank you very much. I look forward to the rest of our engagement this afternoon. Thank you very much, Professor Cereza, uh, for your overview uh, of your book. Um, it's, it's quite very comprehensive, uh, looking at the various parts and the, and, and the chapters within each part. It's really quite very deep and a very comprehensive book, and we can't wait to, uh, to, to read it after this launch. Now it is, it is an honor for me to invite uh, a number of our senior, uh, very extinguished, very established um, academicians and higher education uh, writers and uh, leaders to make some interventions regarding um, uh, the, the book that uh, Professor Celeste has just uh, uh, given us an overview. And to begin uh, that, um, that process, I'll call upon um, a number of, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, interveners, and let me take an opportunity to introduce them all at once so that uh, once um, they begin to do the interventions, we'll, I'll not be introducing them individually one by one as they speak. So with us, we have eight of the most distinguished scholars uh, with us today. Uh, and to begin with, we will have Professor Funmi Olanis, Oloni Sakin, who is the vice president and the vice principal uh, and professor of security leadership and development at King's College London. Uh, her, her bio will be um, you know, uh, shared so that you can be able to read the details of her extinguished career as an, as an academician and a writer. After uh, uh, Professor Funmi, we will have Professor Amina Mama, who is a Nigerian British writer feminist and academic, and also has done quite a lot of work in post-colonial militarism and gender issues in her writing. Thirdly, we will have Professor Buleng Lengabula uh, from South Africa, as an, uh, who is an academician and a university uh, administrator in South Africa and a member of CODESRIA Executive Committee. Fourthly, we will have Professor Tawana Kupe who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Pretoria in South Africa, 
Uh, following um, the professor, we'll have Professor Lee and Shan, who is a professor and director of the Institute of Afro-Asian Studies and Center for African Studies School of International Studies at Peking University. Uh, sixth, we will have Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, is the eighth vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies, uh, all the way from the Caribbean. Seventh, we will have Dr. Mwenda Jarangwe, who is the CEO of the Commission for University Education here in Kenya and also a cultural anthropologist. And last but not least is Dr. Hilge van der Land, who serves as the Global Higher Education Community as Secretary General of the International Association of Universities and the global, uh, which is a global NGO with UNESCO. Um, in that order, I would like now to call upon Professor Funmi Olanisakin, and please forgive me if I haven't pronounced your name accurately. Professor Funmi, the mic is yours. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, let me just say what a pleasure it is uh, to be part uh, of this August gathering um, and to be seeing a number of old friends uh, for the first time uh, in a very long time, especially during this, uh, this pandemic period. I, I think I want to make three sets of points uh, in, in talking about this wonderful collection of essays. Those who have seen the book would have seen my own, um, would have seen the blog uh, that I, I did uh, for this book as Professor uh, Zelesa was just saying. And I think really that is a reflection of how I found uh, this collection of essays. Uh, you have seen uh, a body of work that has brought us full circle. Professor Zeleza, um, in the last few minutes, talked about uh, the different parts of, of this book. But he starts a story uh, from modern day United States, which at the time had <laughs> Donald Trump uh, at the heart of it, uh, and the portrayal of Africa in that, um, within that regime says so much about the kind uh, of identities uh, that Africa has you know, uh, been portrayed at over the last few centuries. But what's really uh, important for me at this moment is to try to connect uh, two sets of things. I think two or three of the parts of this book will help us solidify uh, the place that Africa finds itself today. There's an interdisciplinary uh, story there. There's a historical account that is so solid and is so relevant uh, to today. But I've, I want to talk about the decolonization of knowledges and connect that to the internationalization of education and the place of higher education in Africa today. And I, I think that interpretation, of course, is one part of this story. And I expect, uh, of course, that our other colleagues here uh, would do justice to, to the other segments. And as I do that, it's important that I read to you how uh, Professor Zeleza talks about the project for knowledge decolon decolonization. Uh, you'll find that um, in that part of the book, uh, the e version that I have places it at page 223. Ever since Africa's modern encounters with Europe in the 15th century, African thinkers have confronted the epistemic challenges of Eurocentrism, not to mention the existential and economic threats of European imperialism more generally. Eurocentrism frames African humanity and history as less than a mimetic and perpetually infantile and becoming Europe. The epistemological, ontological, and historiographical tropes of Eurocentrism permeate intellectual and popular discourses on Africa, which distort, disparage, and demean African realities, uh, lives, and experiences. Predictably, Eurocentrism has elicited countervailing affirmations of Africa and Africanness, of African purity, parity and personhood, defiant assertions of African difference from Europe, sameness with Europe and authenticity without Europe. The impulses and imperatives for refashioning the Eurocentric narratives on, about 
and for Africa have mutated during the long historical geographies of slavery, colonialism, and neocolonialism. These three moments constitute the conjunctures through which the unequal exchanges and engagements, confrontations, and contestations between the African and European worlds were produced and reproduced. Clearly, the way these eras were experienced in different parts of Africa varied. Consequently, the trends, tempos, and textures of responses and resistances to Eurocentric knowledges and reclamations and reconstructions of Africa-centered knowledges differed. I, I wanted to do this because as you go through these essays, uh, you begin to, it's palpable. You, you feel uh, the importance of this particular moment in African history where these three eras have positioned Africa in particular ways and have caused a particular interpretation of this vast continent, these lovely peoples, these well-meaning and knowledgeable peoples in a particular frame in the Western mind, in the mind of a Western leader um, whose country itself at the point in time, maybe even so now, is so heavily polarized and they have to look outside of that country to find a way to reposition their own country. You can say the same of uh, European uh, settings as well, where Brexit as defined in that book, as, uh, as explained in that book, has brought about another kind of moment. But everyone, every leader, every nation outside of Africa is in search of an African agenda to define itself. But Africa itself, as this book begins to, you know, uh, to, to show us through those different essays, has had enough of its own upheavals, has had enough of its own lessons to begin to come to a moment in the 21st century where we have to ask, and the debate today is whether Africa can reclaim this century. And the place of higher education and internationalization is where I want to um, stop my own intervention. Because unless uh, we do as, uh, you know, some of these essays tell us, return to that history in order that we can redefine and reimagine the continent for ourselves, but do so as Africans located in Africa and in the diaspora, where today the contestation about who's an African is what we started some of the conversations on the sides of this meeting talking about. It's why we see the events in SOAS being so heated because we have not yet engaged a new generation of Africans about the importance of this continent, about the fact that we must define for ourselves what is Africanness separate from questions of blackness. And so in the diaspora and on the continent, these essays tell the labor, the struggle that we confront as we try to redefine and reclaim the 21st century. I loved reading the essays. And I will advise those of us in the university space to begin to ask of our students to put books like this, put Codestria on the map, put the African institutions uh, that are going to help us confront these various interpretations of Africa since slavery to colonial times and to today, uh, that we put those on the map of our universities on the continent and bring the next generation to us and see the diaspora as a very important part of this debate. And because this author has really traversed three different or four different you know, regions of the world, he has given us such uh, an explicit account of the kind of challenges that we face uh, in this century. Internationalization therefore in our universities must foreground Africa as the place where you have to imagine a particular kind of world and you have to look at Africa in a global context and place it at the center of what we do if we must conquer this uh, particular century. And that's why I referred in my own blog uh, to Paul Zeleza as, uh, as a global African who has really uh, used his own historical accounts and his own reflections of these sorts of moments in the book to help us try to redefine this very moment in the 21st century. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Funme, uh, for your interventions. I'm, I'm sure uh, the participants and Professor Selesa have, have taken note. 
And if there are any questions to you, that I will hope that uh, participants will be able to post it uh, directly to you on the on the Q and A. Before I call uh, Professor Mina Mana, I would like to acknowledge all the young scholars among the participants. Uh, this is a great moment for you also as you navigate your way uh, in the higher education landscape. This opportunity to participate is, in this lounge is much appreciated and we look forward uh, to uh, working with you to ensure that what we do today is going to build tomorrow and add to your growth. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Amina Mama. Thank you, thank you. Um, like for me, before me, I share an intense pleasure at being invited to comment on this massive volume. Um, the essays in it are intense, wide ranging and eminently readable. And most of them are short. Um, that doesn't mean they're not intensely, um, passionately written. Um, they are vintage Paul Tiambe Zaleza and an absolute pleasure to read. Um, his use of uh, adjectives, strings of alliterative adjectives, his use of popular adages, uh, such as, you know, people get the leaders they deserve. These things make it eminently readable, but he's never trivial because alongside an adage like that, he uh, also inserts the facts. People may get the leaders that they deserve, but in his piece, The Tragedy and Trump Triumph, uh, The Tragedy and Farce of Trump's America, he also notes how democracy there itself has been deeply flawed with corporate power, um, the, the, the electoral system and the interference of the FBI, Russia and corporate interference. So we're left thinking, did they deserve it? Did they not? I'll leave that for people to think. But this is an ex just an example of how his writing is not only exacting, it's a kind of intellectual reparation. And it's not just reparative. He also, it's also a reckoning and there can be no reconciliation without this kind of reparation and reckoning. And the volume is, is a fine example. Um, for example, turning the pathologization of Africans on its head. He describes what's gone on uh, in Trump's America as the Obama derangement syndrome. As someone who discovered drapetomania, the disease of Africans inexorably insisting on struggling for freedom. I appreciate this turning on its head, um, this powerful polemical inversion of power. And this is implicit in his, his, his style of writing. So it's deeply decolonial. It's very heartfelt. He's an historian, but he writes from his own journey, as we see in this uh, tour de force that this book is. He writes from his experience. He has lived, thought, felt, the, the, the tyranny of life in the United States. And this maybe explains his, 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 his craft. Uh, Zaleza has lived so long in the USA, the US is globally dominant. And yet throughout all that time, he has continuously been and become and been and stayed a friend of so many Africans minds to quote Toni Morrison again. Um, I first met Paul in 1990. Uh, Paul, you'll remember, it was a conference in academic freedom in Kampala. And I recall you and the two men to whom you have paid tribute in your, in your final uh, chapter, Tandika Mkandewere, who hosted that conference, and Ali Mazrui, both now deceased. But you, they were the two men who from the floor spoke in support of the move that uh, myself, Aisha Imam, Joe Oloko Onyango and yourself, we were advocating that the language of the Kampala Declaration needed to be gendered. It needed not to just use the legalistic his, also it needed to use his and hers because of the patriarchal nature of the system. And you were the, a sprinkling, you were the only guys, the only men at that time, back in 1990, who fully supported the uh, early, I would say, feminist intervention back then. I never forgot it. We've remained friends since that time. So I think of you as friend, comrade, colleague, and brother. So apart from that, I want to say that, um, probably the most 
the, the, one of the things I would like to pick out is that you recap and then you take it forward throughout your essays. You recap the slave trade and that grotesque human trafficking. But as an African from the continent, you introduce the very difficult question of addressing the far less researched and far less understood impact of that slave trade on Africa, how it damaged and interrupted Africa's nascent industrial revolution. We all read Walter Rodney, our Caribbean brother at that time, early on. And what we do know is that this evil trade forcibly captured and exported many of the best, the young, able-bodied African men and women. But what I like is that as an historian, you then trace the continuity between what that did to African political regimes, how it enhanced the worst, the most venal and brutal of our own civilizations, and how those it negatively transformed the continent. And in that way, it is those venal and horrible regimes that have come to prevail. So that even now, many of Africa's problems are inexorably linked to the way in which the bad parts, the worst parts, the most feudalistic and backward and violent militarized parts of Africa's own civilizations became augmented. Whereas the more democratic egalitarian societies did not survive so well. And this is what we live with today. So you're able, you're a time traveler, not just a, a, a traveler in, in space and the geographies of, of global Africa, but a time traveler, an historian whose own subjectivity lives and activates our collective experience and our collective consciousness. And you keep your eye on the epistemological and political manifestations of that in our neo-colonial higher education institutions and in the philosophical dilemmas that continue to haunt Africans at home and abroad. So uh, for me, your writing is most compelling because you are a continental who traveled but constantly returned to the continent. So you understand better than most the difficulties of the diaspora project. Um, you're writing on the power of remittances and how it now is far more than overseas development assistance, how um, it is more stable than the private investments that all our governments are begging for. Um, actually, African people are sending money home and building. And if I look around Accra now, the vast building projects that are going on are a function of those remittances. More than that, however, because a lot of people have had their eye on these money flows, you emphasize the human remittances of which you yourself have lived. We constantly try to bring our intellects and reground them and turn them to the service of the continent. The global system makes that very difficult. And above all, I think historians, our historians on the continent, are probably those who've had the hardest time pursuing the careers that this continent so urgently needs. As everybody, I hear it reiterated again and again, we cannot see our way forward if we do not reckon with our history. So we need you, we need historians, we need these kinds of living and collective histories. Um, the time is too short to possibly do justice. But one of your favorite programs, I remember discussing it, uh, it was on the continent discussed long before it came. And this is the Carnegie Diaspora program, the bringing, the, the creating of a system that would allow intellectual remittances. Um, and, and the understanding that grew out of that, on the one hand, how powerful that is, um, but also how complicated it is because dreams of Africa and the realities of Africa are so different. So that even the um, new generation diaspora, when they return, there are still lots of issues to be ironed out. Um, superi superiority complexes on one side and inferiority complexes and resentments on the other. Um, but nonetheless, this is the way to go. And you emphasize this in your chapter 10 in particular mobilizing the diaspora for sustainable development. And this is no longer a fantasy. I was astonished to, to hear that the Ameri African-American diaspora is so, has so much wealth within it that it, if it was a country, it would be the sixth richest in the world, richer than Egypt, South Africa, and my own Nigeria combined. Of course, that's not happening because most of the rich are part of the global elite, whether they're diaspora or African. 
but it gives an indication of the wealth that is at our disposal were we to be properly organized and to be properly thinking. So this is a major contribution to the epistemological and political decolonization of the way the new generation thinks. And I think that um, the, the importance of this for the youth and for the history of the 20th century to be better understood so that we can do differently in the 21st cannot be understated. And you make it clear again and again. As Africans today, we need to ask which aspects of our societies do we want to lift up and, and, and empower to carry ourselves forward into a more liberated future. The current situation is parlous for most Africans. It means that the 20th century, we largely lost, Nkrumah lost the 20th century. Your question, or your, your, your paraphrasing of Nkrumah, let us make the 21st century ours. That is what I want to really end with. Let us make the 21st century ours. Many of us will not live much further into it. And we've already lost a great many radical revolutionary thinkers. It is up to the next generation. And I would say, I would phrase it somewhat differently. It is not only is it Africa's century, Africa, the continent of Africa is the front line for the future of the entire planet. It has been the continent of globalization's greatest costs and discontents. Writing like this begins to show us the way forward. Africa is the front line of the world. Africa's peoples, wherever they are, need to take up that position and be inspired by, by, by reading work like this. And more than that, by activating their minds, their own experience and their histories collectively to form new ways of thinking, new ways of organizing our economies and new ways of doing. So this book is a huge contribution as indeed are all your other books. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we can just congratulate you, celebrate you and accept you once again, remind ourselves that you are one of us and we are at one with you on this massive Pan-African project. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Amina, uh, for your interventions. Thank you very much. Now allow me to um, uh, bring in Professor Tawama Kupe from University of Pretoria. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, Ambassador, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody. Um, one doesn't know where to start to speak about this uh, third divorce that uh, Professor Zeleza has uh, produced. When he asked me to write a blab, my inclination was to refuse because I thought that better place people and more accomplished scholars could only grace the blab of a book of a man of his an intellect of his stature, a global African of uh, almost unparalleled, but of course he has peers of unparalleled scholarship and insight into what our continent, uh, the, co the continent's history, history both in the sense of the past, history in the sense of the living present, and also the, is the prospects for the future. And I think also what then uh, also attracted and excited me about this book was his, the title of the book and his focus on disruptions. Why so? I think that one of the things that made me really both intellectually frightened and generally worried when the COVID moment struck, and we know it's not a moment, it's something that we don't know when it will end, was the propensity for many people, including scholars, to look at uh, the COVID disruption as a medical disease and also as something that was only of concern, of, uh, of something that had only been caused by a virus, the, COVID, uh, the, the, the coronavirus. What I thought I saw, but I was not sure because most of the dominant discourses at that time did not look at disruptions as something that has been happening since the, uh, the, the early, uh, the, uh, since, since the beginning of this century. So when I saw the title saying Africa and the disruptions of the 21st century, 
it made me have that confidence that if a scholar of Professor Zeleza can say so, it is interesting to delve into his text and also to think that actually we have to think of much that what we're facing is multiple ongoing overlapping and intersectional disruptions that have manifested themselves very sharply in the early 20th century, but also have a very long history as his book actually demonstrates to us. And that he situated himself, as many have said, Professor Amena, Professor Fumi Oli Shaken, he has located himself as a global citizen, but the one who has been rooted, not only in Africa, but also so in the global North. What I found attractive and what is attractive about these essays is this notion, therefore, of multiple ongoing disruptions that are actually, are in some sense, is very contradictory. Let's take the con technology conundrum. Today, I can see right now on my screen, 178 participants at this book launch. If it was a physical book launch, at a particular location. It might not have actually attracted 179 people. It might have attracted more if it was a large conference. But technology has enabled all of us around the world today to be able to sit around and participate in this book launch. But I'm not a positivist person, nor does it know is Professor Paul Zeleza in all he's saying that technology only has positive ends. The technology we're using today also represents our a frozen moment for us that we cannot interact as human beings. We cannot fully develop uh, and engage our humanity because we are now stuck behind uh, computer screens. And so that is what is very, very exciting about uh, this book. It captures the contradictions, the nuances, the difficulties, the conundrums of Africa in the 21st century. And also it's the kind of scholarship that if you like, asks us to rethink the scholarship we have been engaged in, build on all of the insights of the giants, some of who have fallen, Professor Amin, I think, was referring to some of them, and those who are still living, that this kind of scholarships that they built to illuminate earlier centuries, the, 21st, the 20th century, the 19th century, and, and, and further where we have originated as, as Africans. It's a kind of scholarship that in a sense sees many, multiple things happening at the same times and seeks to illuminate us and to connect the dots that we would normally not see, whether they are economic and political, and they are not suggesting um, any kind of boundaries between what is the political and economic, the social, the cultural, and also our relationship with nature, <laughs> nature <laughs> and <laughs> environment. And so, so what, what, made no, me excited, okay. what made me further excited, therefore, about mm. this text? Uh, uh, Prof, can, can I just make a comment? Can we all mute our mics? Because there is some um, open mic which is interfering with your presentation. Please, let's all mute our mics. Thank you. Okay. So, 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 on this theme that I'm on about, about the, what kind of scholarship does one require now to deal with multiple ongoing intersectional and overlapping disruptions is, you know, in a very nuanced, in a very intellectually exciting and provocative way has been presented by Professor Zeleza. I think it's a kind of scholarship that calls for us actually not just to adopt critical theory, whatever one means by that, but I think a transdisciplinary kind of scholarship transdisciplinary in multiple ways, a scholarship that does not limit itself to borders and boundaries. Hence, this text actually moves between the United States and the global north, if you like, into the south, into, into the global south, our continent, Africa, and so on. But also a scholarship where Professor Zeleza does not remain as just as some of us might, or some might know him as a historian. He actually moves effortlessly into somebody who is a historian, who is a, social, a critical sociologist, critical political economist, a person who's critical of technologies, a person who's critical of cultures, a broad range and a rich layered theoretical tradition emerges from his transdisciplinary practice. I think we'll be failing Professor Zeleza and the giants uh, uh, that have fallen that Professor Amina referred to and others uh, 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 referred to and Fumi referred to earlier on. If we do not see his text 
his book as a call to reimagine the African the the the, the African Academy, and to reimagine, of course, using the decolonial lenses and beyond, and also its relationship both to the local as well as to the to the global. So, age old question, as many who are senior to me will tell you, what is the role of the African University, and also how has the African University, in a sense, been also been complicit, implicated? embedded in those things that have not actually, in a sense, not using the word in a, in a, in a, in a, in a reductionist sense, the development of our continent holistically. So I think for me, this is a moment, and this text is one that is very key, Africa and the disruptions of the 21st century, for us to produce, to reimagine the African Academy as at the center of new transformative thinking, actions, and practices that if you like, might be at the center of the rebirth of the continent and the rebirth of the continent, not as supplicate to any other continent, but also as part of a global renewal movement that in a sense will, will save humanity and in, in harmony with nature. Allow me to stop the, the chair. I could go on with this because this is, I've read it twice or thrice now, and each time I see new layers that I did not see before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kupe. That was also quite very you know, enlightening. Um, and like I said in my remarks uh, at the introduction, we look forward to reading and hearing from all of you who have read. We are really excited to you know, get to read it also. But thanks, thanks for your interventions. Uh, now uh, it's uh, my honor to uh, welcome Professor Sahirali Beckles from the University of West Indies. Welcome, Prof. Very good, very good day, uh, colleagues and friends. And uh, thank you so very much for this invitation. My dear friend, Paul, uh, as you stated in your introductory comments, we, we go back 40 years when as young academics, we started our journey in the history department at the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. Uh, uh, I was teaching uh, economic history of the Western world and you were bring in the economic history of the African world. And we, we met there and we became comrades. I, I celebrate you once again for this intellectual intervention because I have long respected you as an activist uh, scholar. And it is that sense of activism which we both shared that drove us inexorably from being young historians to being vice chancellors, <laughs> because we believe that uh, we ought to do something about our research, our knowledge, and we should participate in the management of the environment within which we operate and use our research, uh, our experience to help to shape the institutional world of higher education and to commit to a progressive development of the world. This book uh, emanates from that pedagogical perspective of self and scholarship. It is within that paradigm that you have erupted once again with this magnificent this magnificent literary intervention. When I heard uh, Amina speak about even your intervention in the feminist discourse, and I reflected upon the fact that my first major book was about the enslavement of African women in the Caribbean. And again, we were on the same intellectual trajectory that took us in the, the same directions. But this magnificent book that speaks to the repositioning of Africa in and of itself, and within the context of 
globalization is extremely timely. It required someone of your intellectual stature as well as your experience having lived on all sides of the Atlantic and, and knowing it so well that you were able to forge this conversation within postmodernity. The globalization paradigm and its logical consequence, which is the reparatory justice movement, you fully understand how dialectically these things interact. And, and your essays uh, demonstrate the extent to which you are a dialectician within the context of analyzing historical forces. How else can you explain that Trumpism would follow the eruption of Obama? It is important to see these processes as one and the same, different features of the same paradigm. In other words, you remove mystery from phenomena and place phenomena on the table of scientific inquiry. Certainly, any scholar of quality would have realized that a Trumpism would inexorably have followed Obamaism. It is, it is the dialectics of the evolution of the structures of society, how those structures can at one moment prepare for a progressive advancement and then the dialectical forces prepare for a return to the prior order. And this is how we know that the modern world has evolved. And this is why there is a conversation about whether or not we can, using the dialectical method, understand the movements of the world at any moment in time, and in particular, Africa. We do, you do not use the language of the phase two of Africa's modern nation building, but it, it, is, it is there. Many of the countries are now uh, 60, 70 uh, years into this modern phase of, of nation building, and they have uh, cre Africans have created uh, very effective societies out of a disturbing and disruptive historical past. It is almost miraculous how Africa has been able to rise up from the slaughter, the slave trading, the violent colonization, the brutalization of people, the denigration of blackness and the beauty of it, and how they have been able to do that, to build nations that are, that are viable and given their citizens opportunities to, to thrive. But there are contradictions within the process. There are legacies that continue to haunt the process. And all of these have now been highlighted in this age of recentering Africa around a new global thrust and how the Western world is once again thinking about Africa and its resources and how Africa's political leadership in many countries have capitulated to those interests and as a result, undermining their internal processes of change or transformation. It is indeed a dialectical process. And so, yes, you, you interrogate the, the, the texture of Africa's political leadership and what has taken place on the ground in communities around the discourse of development. As a scholar, of course, you could not avoid engaging in the higher education process. What drives the relevance of education? what drives the relevant of research and how that research ought to be the evidentiary basis of policy. And again, the, the, the frustration of the scholar within the context of policy formation and the role of the state and how in many societies, the, the principal paradigm is citizens versus state. I recall this very well when I went to uh, Durban, South Africa in 2001 to lead the Caribbean delegations to discuss reparatory justice. 
And that was a classic case of the dialectics of citizens versus state. In that global conference on reparations, the civil societies of Africa, the church, the trade unions, the students, the academia, all of those civil society organizations came to Durban to support the reparatory justice movement, to support the leadership the Caribbean was provided on this subject. But at, and, but at the same time, while the civil society organizations were supporting reparatory justice, every African government, every state, every president came to Durban to reject the Caribbean initiative around reparatory justice and to, and to vote with the Europeans against the black people of the diaspora. And so we had the leaders of Africa and the leaders of Europe coming together to suppress the reparatory justice movement. But at the same time in Africa, the civil society organizations and leaders and scholars and all of the civil society groups were saying we were standing with the Caribbean on this. We were standing with the diaspora while their governments were standing against us. So we understand the dialectics of this process. And this is very important for understanding the context of Africa and the 21st century disruptions. I join with you, my friend, in celebrating the work and the scholarship of Ali Mazrui, who has given us a perspective on, on African civilization and its vitality and relevance to the 21st century and beyond, and how humanity will benefit in the end fundamentally from the cosmologies and the, and the epistemologies erupting from African civilization that will help to shape this 21st century. And this is very important. This is a good place to end. And of course, and, and Tandika, who I admired, I, I met him uh, when I first went to Cordisria back in the back in the late 80s, and he was there, and I spent some time uh, uh, there in Dakar. And I too uh, celebrate with you and uh, remembering his scholarship and remembering his philosophical underpinnings. Uh, this, this book then is extremely timely. It is, it is indeed a kind of manifesto vision for how to look at this 21st century. At that same conference where I spoke at Durban and I found myself sitting alphabetically um, Beckles, and I on my left was uh, Arafat, and on my right was Castro. And I remember sitting between these two giants and saying to myself, what am I going to say when I go to the podium? I went to the podium and I said, the 21st century is going to be the century of global reparatory justice, and it's going to be the greatest political movement of the 21st century. And this was dialectically based on what we knew before, because we knew that it took us all of the 19th century to uproot slavery from the world, chattel slavery. It took all of the 19th century from Haiti in 1804 to Brazil in the 1880s. Then it took us all of the 20th century to translate black freedom, black legal freedom into human rights and civil rights took us all of that, from Marcus Garvey through to Malcolm X, Martin Luther King to Nelson Mandela. It took us all of that 20th century to get our human and civil rights enshrined. And then I said the 21st century is going to be the century where we translate that into reparatory justice for all the crimes that have been committed against Africa and its people. And that this is dialectically sung. This is, this is a projection of historical forces. This is the century where oppressed people of modernity, all of those people who have had their resources plundered and, and their nations destroyed, this is gonna be the century where all of them globally will rise up against the crimes of modernity. And this book gives us the framework, gives us the understanding of why this is going to be so. And it is not, not only an intellectual tool, it's evidence of the legitimacy of, of the argument. And so my brother, I thank you again for this contribution out of the consciousness 
of a scholar who is also a higher education administrator, who is also a humanist, who is also a global civil rights icon. We thank you for all of this. Continue to write. This is volume one. Give us, give us the, the second volume as soon as you can. Thank you so very much. And it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Sapekels, for your intervention and for reiterating the, the point about the 21st century belonging to us and also the point about dialectics that I've seen a number of participants have commented upon. Thank you so much uh, for that. I would like now uh, to invite Dr. Mwenda Daragui to make his intervention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ruthie, and thank you, Paul, for this wonderful opportunity. As you can see, I'm in the back of a car coming from one meeting uh, to another, but uh, what an opportunity it is to be celebrating uh, Paul Zaleza's book, which I had the pleasure of reading and enjoying because uh, I have known Paul for a long time. And I know when he writes, I need to sit down and read and read carefully. I remember that uh, I met Paul uh, in his early years uh, in the US uh, in 1994 at a summer institute organized by the African Studies program at the University of Illinois, where I was a student in grad school. And it is there where I realized what a brilliant scholar he was and what, how passionate he was about Africa. And this is very much captured in the work that he has done in this book. And then later, I had the chance of reading the book that uh, Godwin talked about, uh, Manufacturing African, African Studies and Crisis. And I was challenged by that book because I remember one of the things that uh, was very clear to me was when, when Paul talked about these fly-by-night uh, academics and academic tourists, and uh, even went in and talked about anthropologists, and uh, my field is anthropologist. So I felt a little indicted by Paul, and I thought, I need to read more about this book. I, I, I read it, and I must say, it really inspired the kind of writing I have done myself uh, when it comes to articulating Africa and uh, African studies and how Africa is um, projected, thought about, written about. But today we celebrate yet another book 24 years later where Paul has put together some really fascinating short essays written by a historian who is commenting on contemporary issues. It is not always easy uh, to combine the two without turning into sort of a contemporary studies kind of writing. But Paul has this ability to pick a topic that is current and yet go deeper into history and show the roots and how it formed. And that's why uh, he's able, for instance, to show that some of the subtle things that are ignored come back to become the critical catalysts of things that happen in uh, the processes that take place. Let me take, uh, when he wrote about Brexit, uh, Brexit is something that happened many, many, many years ago when Britain, as Paul shows, was struggling with its idea of Europeanness. And it wasn't something that anyone would have picked up unless you did a historical study. And he helps us understand the genesis and roots of these things that uh, most of the time happen when we hardly know them uh, or can see them. And uh, he talks about the digital disruption. He talks about the financial crisis facing universities. He talks about the challenges of leadership and real scholarly or academic production that is anchored in Africa's and Africans realities. This I would say is the most important part for me as uh, someone who is involved in the uh, regulation of uh, university education in Kenya, uh, where Paul and I uh, uh, work very closely. But uh, he also 
helps us understand something that is very, very clear in his mind, which is that he is talking both as an insider and also kind of an objective uh, 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 outsider who is looking at a historical analysis while also looking at the practices of it. Let me, let me uh, say something a, a little bit about uh, uh, the, the, the book uh, that we are, we are also talking about today. Zeleza's writing allows us uh, to see a very complex um, analysis of phenomena that looks at how these seemingly minor interventions can contribute to the catastrophes that we often see. We've seen uh, him talk about the role of the state, something that had been gutted by the neoliberal uh, market-oriented disruptions of the 19th and, 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 and 20th century, and shows, especially when he talks about the coronavirus, how the coronavirus ripped open any certainties about the globalization machinery that was set up to dilute and eventually eliminate the role and power of the state. African states were supposed to have to cut back on their interventions in social services because they needed to allow their countries to freely engage in the open market or what they call the free market. This was being done, as Paul shows us, while European and Asian nations were themselves practicing protectionism, hidden under the guise of quality control. Then Corona happened and the role of the state became central to the responses that were to be uh, in, in, involved there. I wanted to talk about also the personalizing or personalized view that uh, Paul brings to his writing. And wanted to read something when he talked about Africa as seen through uh, the, the comments in, in, the, in, the, in the challenges that were brought by Ebola. I think it was uh, page 2008, 208 for those of you who have the book, the hard copy, uh, if you get a chance. It says a lot, and let me just read it quickly. I, ha I was afraid of Ebola because it was robbing me of my African authenticity when I failed to give special insights into the nature of the disease to inquiring colleagues or the media about the culinary delights of eating monkey meat that had apparently sparked Ebola and the strange primeval customs that helped spread it like wildfire. The fact that I was not a medical doctor or from the three affected countries did not matter. I was an African. Or had I become too Americanized to understand my African disease heritage? Maybe I was not too Americanized enough to speak authoritatively about things I knew little about not even when it came to that simple place with a single story called Africa, end of quote. Paul is able to bring that kind of sarcasm to speak about something so important because he understands the way in which Africa has been constructed, Africa has been imagined, Africa has been represented. And for him, it is an African uh, challenge for us to do more of these kinds of projects and to put Africa's uh, narratives in the right manner. Because as you see, uh, as you seen throughout his writing, uh, Paul does not just critique outsiders, quote unquote, but critiques insiders who are also not very good at showing the both complex and connected sides of the African story. Now, let, let me, let me um, say that when reading this book and seeing the way Paul takes topics that he is writing about reminded me of uh, the post-election violence in Kenya in 2007. And I remember when I met with Paul, he had just uh, written a piece about uh, that post-election violence. And I thought, what could he have captured with a short 
one or two month uh, visit uh, to the continent. But I was astonished at how detailed Paul was able to capture the realities on the ground. And that is how I know Paul pays attention to detail, to information, to sources, and puts together a story that allows the person who is not there to be what we call in anthropology, like they are there in that context. So I want to congratulate Paul for this wonderful book. It's an opportunity for a second book, I think, as, uh, as our uh, brother from uh, Caribbean has said. And I want to challenge Paul. When I was re reading this, I was, I was saying, I wish that the last paragraph that Paul gives in each of his accounts was enlarged so that we can see Paul the practitioner more, because in, a, in higher education, for instance, he's been in higher education for a long time. And when you talk about the challenges facing higher education in this stage of disruption, there are some things Paul has done either at USIU or at Quinnipiac or when he was in, uh, down in California that have made a difference in the institutions and also in the way we manage uh, uh, higher education in general. How I wish that Paul could take the next book and share the story of what he has done uh, in, in order to respond to some of the challenges that he has given in uh, this book, so that we can see not just Paul the historian, who is sometimes is very descriptive, but Paul the practitioner, who can sometimes be also prescriptive. Thank you for the opportunity and congratulations, Paul. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mwenda, for your interventions and uh, for the observations about uh, the writings of Professor Zadessa, even from you know, the earlier on. Thank you so much. Then quickly, we can uh, invite Dr. Hilige uh, to make her intervention. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> I guess you can. Yes. Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you very well. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to speak to you this time from, again, a different part of the world. I am uh, sitting here in a UNESCO-based uh, office where I am the Secretary General of the International Association of Universities. And it is a very great honor for me to be here today with so many esteemed colleagues from around the world, some of whom I know well uh, from face-to-face -face meetings and others from reading them. Um, it is really a very good day to celebrate such an important achievement, Paul, uh, and a book that, as everybody has said so far, is really a book that will make a difference for the future. So thank you very much for having invited me to the table today uh, and to also say a few words uh, from my perspective. I'm very pleased to say that Paul is an esteemed member of the administrative board of the International Association of Universities, the global association representing the global voice of higher education. And he is the perfect voice for African higher education on the board, together with his uh, member uh, of the board colleagues, Ebenezer Owusu from Ghana and Gulam Mohamed Bai, who is a former president of the association. So his voice is definitely very important to uh, really uh, also make uh, the, it possible to build bridges between different realities around the world and bring to the table what is happening as far as higher education is concerned on the continent while, and that many have said as well, also um, building bridges to other realities, the Canadian ones that he knows so well, or the US ones, and many other systems that he knows from inside. So I thank you for the book. I had read various of your papers along the way, yet it is much better to have them here all together in such an impressive book. Indeed, in reading the book, I could concentrate as well on the different chapters that you have committed, I would say, on um, identifying what uh, it means to develop a university um, in different countries in Africa, and maybe so specifically as well in uh, Kenya. The book questions in a very nice way how African universities that were considered, as you say, 
costly irrelevances at best and political unrest at worst back in the 90s, and how they became over time and specifically so since the early 2000s, essential to the creation of new knowledge economies and for the development of society. So it was fascinating to see how these chapters echo as many key conferences where the presentations initially were made, um, but they must have few numerous debates and must have made a real difference on the ground, as was said as well by the different colleagues on the panel today. I am sure that the book itself will resonate and will result in new debates and will again make a new difference for the future. It is fascinating to see as well how you talk about Africa on African issues and at the same time how you de debate the becoming of society at large. I would read the book as well as an invitation to the reader to rethink the way in which individual stands in the world and how they relate to one another and to really become critical thinkers of their own positioning in the global reality. I particular, particularly appreciated the important chapters debating the construction of Africa uh, through the higher education systems and the different challenges that you highlight, how they resonate with uh, and difficulty of institutional supply or the resource deficit or how you face so many faculty issues, um, research challenges uh, and issues of outputs and how they can resonate and travel the world and how then the leadership is also coming with specific leadership challenges. At the same time, you said so at the beginning as well, and some have picked it up in the conversation already, you put very nicely how to uh, actually rethink the value proposition of higher education. And there you don't look only at African higher education institutions, but you actually question the value proposition of higher education at large. With this um, incredibly difficult um, tension between on the one hand the, being these institutions to cultivate an enlightened citizenship, generate new knowledge, be inclusive, integrative uh, access to all and innovative at the same time, and be also very much hands-on by providing the employability opportunities that are so much required for the generations that come through the system. And so you advocate on the one hand for something that so many countries are struggling with, how to offer work integrated learning and experiential opportunities. And at the same time, put at the heart and center of everything that we do as higher education institutions um, and to put at the center of that value-based higher education and to actually foster well-educated, open-minded, curious, critical thinking citizens able to connect to the local and to understand the global at the same time. And you give various frameworks um, around that, not the least Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, the, uh, the agenda with its philosophy, but you also recall Agenda 2063, you look at regional visions, um, and maybe it is also a very nice opportunity to connect what you're actually doing in the book through the various chapters with a broader discussion that is upcoming uh, in the context of the upcoming UNESCO World Higher Education Conference 2021, and which envisages to draft a roadmap for higher education for the future. So the many topics that you put on the table, the various challenges faced maybe more specifically in African countries, but also faced by other institutions around the world, the value proposition debate that is so essential to rethink everywhere to actually also make sure that the different voices from around the table are at the table when we discuss the future of our society, because we should be equally uh, involved from uh, Africa or from Asia or from Latin America, North America, from the Caribbean um, or from, from Europe. We should sit at the table as, uh, as equal partners and look at how to build a, a future, a new 
all together. So you put at the heart of everything, this importance of the global and the local challenges. And I very much like the way uh, at how you, you portray the important um, uh, different vision on internationalization of higher education through the lens of Africa. Something that you bring to the table very eloquently at the IAU conferences in general and through the various um, webinars that we organize or that are organized by other uh, like-minded or different-minded, uh, very good associations of universities around the world. So thank you for having this energy to uh, always bring to the table and to connect the realities. So really, I think it is a unique opportunity to rethink what we do, um, to take on board the different perspectives that you share through the different chapters and to connect um, the, the, the different continents. Somebody said so. It's a unique way to put on glasses out of North America in, in one of the papers and then look uh, around the world. Or you take on other glasses out of Kenya and you look at the world and same similar questions, but from different perspectives. And that is a richness that not many people um, Master, and that is really unique to this book as well. Um, many of the people, though, sitting around the table could argue they have uh, these many glasses in their drawers as well. And that comes through what you also explain when it comes to the higher education construction in Africa, where people have traveled to many other countries already, or to Europe or to North America. And those exchanges gives such a rich uh, new look on the world that we should all be envious of. And I think that the book definitely is, um, is a new stone into uh, the construction of a reality and you that we all wish to co-construct together. So I thank you for this beautiful opportunity. I know time is short and we would also like to leave a little bit of time for some discussion. Uh, I am just only pleased to be here. We will take the book to a next level, hopefully by also advertising for it in our networks. And I hope to welcome you uh, and, and colleagues from around this uh, virtual table today to maybe other discussions that uh, I would be very pleased to co-organize together with you, uh, Paul Zeleza. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to some discussion uh, if time permits. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Hilige, for your interventions and uh, for giving us an insight into the book uh, from different perspectives, from your point, from your glasses, uh, for that matter. Thank you so much. Um, last but not least, Professor Leah Shan um, is not able, uh, was not able to connect. Um, he's, 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 he had some issues with the network. So I'm going to read um, his intervention that he has shared with us. And it goes on to say, uh, Professor Paul Zeleza's other important book is out. I must congratulate on my friend's new contribution. As a collection of essays, it indicates the author's broad views and covers several important fields, such as the contemporary crisis of Afro-American with the 400 years root of American racial dysfunctions diaspora's long-time efforts for sustainable development, African political dramas with the great persons and ordinary people struggles for democracy and better life, the decolonization of African knowledge, knowledges and reckoning of the history and future of African studies, the challenges of African universities in terms of capacity building, employability, financial shortage, ETC, which indicates an Afro American intellectuals, historical insight and realistic concerns. As usual, Paul has set us a good example of what a university professor should think about and what his or her should care about for a better future of Africans as well as the mankind. We should always remember our responsibility. This is a statement from Li Ashan, Professor of History of Peking University and President of Chinese Society of African Historical Studies. He wishes he could be with us virtually, but he has had challenges uh, with um, his uh, connection. So we appreciate him and we appreciate the uh, inter interventions that he has shared with us 
uh, through the email that I've just uh, read uh, to you. So that brings us to the conclusion of our uh, intervention, interventions from the various scholars who, has, who have spoken. And now we move on to uh, the Q&A and uh, there are quite a number of questions. There are some of your questions that you, have, you had sent earlier that uh, was uh, sent to uh, uh, Professor um, Zeleza. But I would like to begin uh, maybe with the questions that the participants have just posted uh, on the Q&A. Uh, there are currently eight questions and I'll just take maybe three at a time. Um, the first one is from um, Ali Hamed, who has uh, said that since Professor Celeste has got the ball rolling, will there be an initiative to create programs in innovation and entrepreneurship in higher education across the continent? The research here gives us a clear direction. And he says anyone can answer. Uh, the next question um, is uh, from Stephen Moutier, and uh, it says, in decolonizing knowledges, how do you reconcile the different voices that represent the African story? Africans in Africa, Africans in the diaspora, the millennials, etc. And that one, uh, I will direct it to Professor Zeleza. Uh, the next question is Professor, uh, from Professor Martin Joroge. And Professor Njoroke makes an, uh, an observation. Uh, wonderful remarks by Professor Amina Mama. Indeed, dreams of Africa and reality of Africa are very different. Your observation reminds me of the character of Obi, uh, Obi Nojebe's novel, Things Fall Apart. He has such dreams in his, of his country. Nigeria, during his studies in England, upon his return, Nigeria he was disillusioned when he came face to face with reality on the ground. How, in your opinion, do we close this gap between reality and the dream of Africa? What should be the role of the scholars, the current African leadership, the Africans in the continent and the Africans in the diaspora in, the, in making this possible? So I'll, I'll um, ask first of all, Professor Zelesa to comment uh, on the question uh, that was asked by Stephen Moutier and then uh, Professor Amina, uh, this last question and the first question anyone, anyone of the uh, panelists can answer. To you, Professor Zeleza. Um, first of all, let me just say thank you very much uh, to the uh, colleagues who, and friends who made uh, comments uh, on the book. Uh, really the generosity of your remarks and observations um, uh, you know, make me uh, feel very humbled. Uh, let me just very briefly address the question by Stephen Moutier. Uh, I think, you know, the, the project of decolonizing African knowledges uh, has been going on for a very long time. Uh, there is, in fact, a whole chapter in the book that discusses that. And one of the things that I advocate is, A, for us to deeply immerse ourselves in the different libraries, as uh, Modimbe calls them, the different libraries, uh, in other words, the different epistemic systems that have been created to analyze, to imagine, to represent, to construct Africa. Uh, a lot of us are familiar with the colonial library, but there are other libraries that we need to familiarize ourselves with. And these libraries go, you know, millennia. So that's the first thing, deep immersion in Africa's multiple libraries. And secondly, is at an individual level, a spirit of humility, an understanding that you are scratching the surface of whatever it is you are engaged in, which also entails the need for belonging and participating actively in networks, in communities of scholarship that then uh, provide you with a kind of energy, the kind of scope, the kind of breadth and depth of understanding and ability to produce knowledges that could be not only useful in understanding what's going on, but also transformative. So collaboration is extremely important. Collaboration as an individual, collaboration as communities, and within the academy, the importance as one of the commentators mentioned uh, of transdisciplinarity, Professor Kupe talked about that, interdisciplinarity and uh, getting away from these silos. So the projects of 
decolonizing knowledges in brief is multi-dimensional. Uh, it is an institutional project, is an intellectual project, is an ideological project, and is certainly also an individual's project. Uh, but the key thing in my view is deep immersion in Africa's complex libraries and trying to see how the different libraries, uh, to use the word uh, that Hilja used, uh, how those uh, glasses, uh, those, those uh, you know, views uh, enlighten society. And in trying to do that, uh, uh, you know, uh, my, my colleague, uh, my friend uh, from Mona, um, you know, mentioned something extremely important. And that's what we historians are trained in, to understand reality and the changes in reality as always a dialectical process. I, I know that it's not a full answer, but I encourage you to buy the book. There, there's a whole chapter dealing with the de decolonization project. Yeah, thank you, Professor Zeleza. Uh, Professor Amina, maybe you can um, respond briefly to the question by Professor Martin Joroge. Sure. Um, I would like to say um, thank you for the question. Um, I concur with what uh, my friend Paul was just saying. You know, we really do need to ensure continuous communication and exchange and mutual education, patience, humility. Um, sometimes we've been involving on parallel tracks. I recently reconnected with my colleagues in the feminist colleagues in the Caribbean, and we both set up journals 20 years ago, 20, how many thousand miles apart? We'd moved in parallel, so reconnecting was very powerful, and we might both be further ahead had we continued the connection we began with. Um, but I also want to say that apart from that, um, on the matter of leaders, as the recently deceased feminist and sister Nawal El Sadawi observed in a BBC interview that was replayed after her sad departure this week, we cannot leave it to leaders. They will not liberate women. We have to liberate ourselves. So I would reiterate that and just remind us all that freedom is not given, it has to be taken. But having said that, educators are often looked to as leaders and not all our educators are liberators. We just have to look at the neocolonial nature of most of our neoliberal universities that are disciplinary and disciplining of young minds. Uh, they are institutions that can have very pacificatory effects on the intelligence of the future. So we need to take account of that and, and challenge our institutions of learning and our educators to get over their androcentrism, to get over and deal with these issues of sex for grades, for example. These things are crushing for young minds. So the violence of the neoliberal academy, both economic and structural, and how it damages the young, should be a cautionary note to us. We really need to rethink education. What kind of pedagogy are we using? If we say we are humble when students are used to incredible hierarchy, if you're very humble, I've learned you'd be disrespected. So, you know, we're dealing with contradictions on a daily basis. So, um, you know, do you use hierarchy? Do you not use it? I'm against it. But in practice, this is a very challenging thing because our people have, our young people have often been beaten into hierarchy before you even meet them in the classroom. So I would say that a lot of um, masculinist and existential psychological uh, violences that go on in our institutions of learning. And we have to challenge these if we actually want to um, be able to educate, especially when it comes to educating across borders, where we're dealing with different institutional cultures. The culture of the US diaspora and the culture of the Caribbean classroom isn't the same. They have colonial commonalities, but they're all hierarchical. They all tend to favor disciplinary canons. And think of the canon as a weapon. Huh? Think of it, the canon. Uh, I won't uh, do the, any further metaphors there, but it's a crushing weapon. So I do want to say we have pedagogic challenges, we have structural challenges, and this is why a network like Kodesria or indeed the Gender Studies Network or in the Caribbean, the Feminist Studies Network that I learned from back in the 80s when they were just starting that up and then took to Africa. There are alternative ways of connecting. A gathering like this is far more democratic than a classroom. 
partly because we're all quite grown up, but we need our young people to have much more democratic pedagogies and to be able to grow and thrive on those and lead their own learning. Because we can't make them read these days, even these lovely short essays, we can't make anybody read. So we have to be very creative and innovative. And I do believe um, that actually crossing borders helps undo the hierarchies and the disciplines because it forces people to engage with their relational practices and their psychological uh, states. So I think there's huge scope and I'd like a lot more transatlantic collaborations. I want all the Caribbean here and I want to revisit the Caribbean. I learned so much from my own journeys around various parts of the Caribbean um, before I even returned home to start working on this continent um, back in the early nineties first time. I circulate, uh, we talk about circulation. We should facilitate this circulation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Mina. Um, and because of time, we need to end this session by five, uh, uh, at six o'clock. So I'll just uh, give one question to Prof. Zeleza so that we can have uh, the rest of the program. Uh, for, from Costa Mulea, um, she's asking, what has been the pitfalls and impediments to African unity and the African nation that must be? Uh, Prof. Zeleza, any comment? Yes, a, a, a lot of impediments. One is, of course, uh, colonial history tough, the machinations of imperialism, the nature of the post-colonial state, uh, the nature of African uh, elites, uh, you know, political classes, uh, the nature of our uh, politics in, the, you know, in its multidimensional uh, forms, gender politics, uh, class politics, uh, ethnic politics, you name it. Uh, all these are impediments. But at the same time, we also have to remember uh, that there have been countervailing movements uh, in which Pan-Africanism uh, you know, developed, uh, you know, uh, started in the diaspora, and then our nationalist leaders uh, you know, got uh, involved in that, the Kenyatas, the Bandas, uh, the Nkrumahs, and so on and so forth, uh, creating a new vision, a new uh, you know, aspiration uh, for being African in the uh, world of nations. Uh, so, and then of course, the other movements that have taken place, social movements, women's movements, environmental movements, religious movements, labor movements, as well as intellectual movements. So what you find like, you know, is, is typical of reality is that there are these uh, sort of, uh, you know, dialectical again to use, uh, you know, the word that uh, Hillary uh, used uh, in which, you know, all these forces are constantly uh, you know, struggling and they, you get a temporary resolution in terms of, you know, uh, one particular force seemingly having won that moment. And then of course the countervailing forces uh, come back and, uh, you know, the struggle continues. So I think we have to look at the impediments very seriously in their global, uh, regional, national, institutional, um, and even at, uh, with us as individuals. And at the same time, look at the opportunities and the possibilities uh, for forging, uh, you know, the kinds of movements, the kinds of connections, the kinds of partnerships, collaborations, and, and engagements that, uh, you know, uh, countervail uh, some of these. And in education, uh, you know, the point that uh, Hiroji was, uh, was making, internationalization has to be part of that agenda. Uh, for, for me, for example, and I'll close with this, uh, the most transformative experience of my life as a young intellectual, uh, occurred on the campus of the University of the West Indies. Because there I was, from the continent, engaging these absolutely incredible minds. And Hillary uh, will remember, you know, you know, we had all these, uh, you know, great uh, Caribbean intellectuals. Uh, you know, uh, we had seminars all the time. And after the seminar, you know, they'll be very heated and so on. And I learned that having a heated debate doesn't mean you don't like each other. Because after that, we'll go to the senior common room and continue the debate. So, you know, um, being able to circulate, to use Amina's term, uh, is extremely important in forging countervailing strategies, countervailing politics, countervailing engagements. Okay, thank you, Professor Zeleza. There are many, many questions, and uh, unfortunately, we're um, coming towards the end of the program, and um, uh, I think yeah. Professor Celeste would note your questions and maybe find a way of responding uh, to them because they are really all very good questions, uh, but we've run out of time. Um, and so at this juncture, uh, my apologies for 
Evelyn, Musa, Matt, Mank, Teresa Moe, and all the other people who have questions that uh, they're posted uh, on the Q&A because we are, we've run out of time. I would like at this juncture uh, to thank all uh, the uh, speakers and also uh, for the answering of all the questions that have been posed, although we are not able to answer all of them, and to thank all those who have posted their questions um, and um, contributed in terms of the comments that you have made on the chat uh, and uh, your comments regarding uh, the various different interventions. Those are all uh, very welcome, and I think all the participants were able to see all the posted comments um, and congratulatory messages to Professor Zeleza. It's now, um, I have the opportunity now to invite Dr. Kevin Desai, uh, the chair of the USIU Africa Board of Trustees and Principal Secretary and Ministry, of H, uh, Ministry for East African Community in Kenya uh, to move a vote of thanks. Dr. Desai. Thank you very much, Professor Rono. And indeed, what a great afternoon this has been and how stimulating all the discussions have been with respect to, you know, showing, you know, almost an array of um, reflections. And, um, and indeed, I'd like to thank you all for showing so much passion towards my friend Paul's diverse intellect. We very much uh, appreciate this. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Council for the Development of Social Sciences, Research in Africa, could it, Kodisria, and the United States International University of Africa. And on my own behalf, I extend a hearty vote of thanks to Professor Paul Zeleza and other invited speakers for gracing this event and sharing with us your insights and opinions on Professor Zeleza's book, which is bound to make an impact on the landscape of African studies. I'd like to thank Professor Zeleza for his continuous efforts towards uplifting the cause of the African continent and his studies of the African academic diaspora. It has indeed been interesting to be challenged to imagine new ways to think about the continent and what could be done to secure its future. I'd like to register a deep appreciation to the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa. And by extension, and by extension it's, it's Secretary Dr. Goodwin Rungar for the Council's involvement in the publication of the book. I'd like to thank each of the speakers who have taken their time to not only be here with us today, but also to share critical insights with us. I thank Professor Pun Mi Olon Sakin, Professor Amina Mama, Professor Puleng Lenka Bula, Professor Tawana Kupe, Professor Lee Anshan, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Dr. Mwendwa Tarangui, and Dr. Hilgwe Land, Rantland. We do not take your contribution lightly, and indeed, this event has been made richer by your presence. I'd also like to acknowledge and appreciate the efforts by the team at Council for Development of Social Science Research in Africa for their support and guidance in bringing this event together. In the same breath, I also acknowledge the efforts by the team from USIU Africa for their enormous cooperation in the organization of this event. I'd also like to thank our moderator for the day, Ambassador Professor Rono, the immediate de past Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Academic and Student Affairs for United States International University Africa, for ably moderating the session. And finally, I cannot thank each and every one of you enough for your involvement and your willingness to make this event a success. We have participants from at least 46 countries globally in attendance. We hope that this has inspired you to source the book for further reading and interrogation. I thank you all once again for being with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Desai, and it's uh, now my honor to invite uh, Dr. Godwin Murunga to make closing remarks. Well, no, thank you very much, Professor Rono, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kevin Desai, for the word of thanks. Uh, I think it's been a very uh, long afternoon, uh, so mine would be to return my word of thank you to Professor Zeleza for the pleasure of having to publish this text. 
uh, all the panelists who spoke, uh, but also to thank them very much and to make, uh, you know, when you have a manuscript like this one, uh, Professor Zaleza will know there are a whole number of faces that uh, make it uh, possible for the publication to come, but never really uh, get to be had. Uh, I wanted to, uh, to share my public thank you very much to colleagues in the department, in the program of uh, publication and dissemination uh, who worked with uh, Professor Zaleza on this manuscript. And in particular to single out uh, Professor Ibrahim Ogachi Oanda, uh, who is the head of the program. But even more importantly, my colleague Shifao, uh, who uh, is in charge of the production process. Uh, Professor Leza will know the thousands of the hundreds of emails that were exchanged uh, on this. So I just wanted to flag this as uh, something that is important on behalf of the Codestria Executive Committee, uh, the president who is uh, uh, listening in the background, uh, Professor Isabel Casimiro uh, from Mozambique, uh, and other members of the executive committee, I want to return a word of thank you. I hope you get a copy of the book and uh, read it. We'll be very happy to hear your thoughts. Uh, the council will be planning another event uh, very soon. Uh, we published a Codestria bulletin number 56 of 2020 on the situation in Mali, anticipating a discussion, broader discussion on the Sahel. So we'll be sending out an invitation to all of you to join us for another discussion on the situation uh, in the Sahel very soon. So thank you very much and all the very best uh, for the day and evening, depending on where you are. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And this uh, brings us to the end of our book lounge today. Thank you so much and be safe. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the evening or the day. Thank you.